listen to the terms of this covenant. And God wants to speak to us today about the covenant. And uh, a lot of times we we uh, we talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament. We talk about the law and we talk about grace. We talk about these different eras. But what God's really interested in is God wants to come into covenant with us. The, the Old Testament is actually the Old Covenant. The New Testament is actually the New Covenant. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, those terms are actually a little bit misleading because it's the same covenant. Yes. And uh, a lot of times we, we, we talk about the law. We talk about the Ten Commandments and the Torah and, and the, the Jewish law that is, it was given in the book of Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. Those, those are the books of the law, or the books of the Torah. And uh, we often talk about that, but what we don't always talk about is the fact that all of those things were actually God wanting to come into covenant with his people. And mm -hmm. God, wants to, God wants to talk to us again about that covenant. God wants to make covenant with you. He, makes, he wants to make an agreement with us. And he wants to bring you into relationship with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Jeremiah, the prophet, was addressing the people of Israel. And by this time, the, the nation of Israel had a long history, probably a thousand years, of covenant with God. When Moses went up on the mountain and received the Ten Commandments, and God wrote them in the stone and... and uh, what actually took place in there is God said, I am bringing my people, the, the, the nation of Israel, I'm bringing them into covenant with me. I'm bringing them into agreement with me. And today God wants to uh, not make a new covenant with us, but he wants to remind us or restore the covenant. He wants to remind us that we are in relationship with him. We are in, a, he wants to make an agreement with us. And that's what Jeremiah was telling the people of Israel here. He was reminding them. He said, I want you, God told Jeremiah the prophet, he says, I want you to remind my people of the covenant that I made with them. Mm -hmm. The covenant that we have, it's like a binding agreement. It's like a contract that God signed with his people, the Israelites. And uh, God has extended that covenant to us. And he's reminding us today that we are in covenant with him. We're in agreement with him. We're in a binding legal contract with God Almighty. It's almost scary to think about that. It's amazing to think about that God in heaven, the perfect God, the almighty God, the God that created everything, mm -hmm. the God that is all-powerful, the God that could do anything he wanted, wanted to make an agreement, wanted to have a binding contract with me. Yeah. And uh, today we're going to talk about that covenant. He says, uh, tell them in verse 3 this, that this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Cursed is the one who does not obey the terms of this covenant. The terms I commanded your ancestors when I brought them out of Egypt, out of the iron smelting furnace. Okay, well... Uh, that's an important phrase because we're going to talk a little bit about, about how that heat had something to do with this, with this covenant. Mm -hmm. God was reminding Jeremiah, he said, I want you to remind the people a thousand years ago, I brought them out of a furnace, out of an iron smelting furnace. An iron smelting furnace is a furnace that gets incredibly hot mm -hmm. and the whole purpose of it is to heat iron until it becomes liquid. Once it becomes liquid, then it can be formed into whatever that they want to form iron into. And then when it cools down and sets up, then it becomes iron again. It becomes solid. It becomes something that can be used in building and, and making weapons and all kinds of, of tools and implements and stuff like that. But before it can be useful, it has to be heated to a, a high temperature so that it can become moldable and pliable. And so God was reminding Jeremiah to tell the people 
that there was a time when I had to heat you up and, and make you pliable and flexible so that I could form you into what I wanted to form you. Mm -hmm. God is God has a purpose and a design for your existence. Mm -hmm. You're not here by accident. Your 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 birth was no mistake. Your birth didn't happen by happenstance. You were created by God. You were designed by God. Your personality, your hair color, your height, your your eye color, all of the things that make you up Mm. that you you were maybe have thought, well, that's just the way I am. It's not just the way right. you are. It's the way you were created. It yeah. was the way you were designed. Your mm. personality. Everything about you, some of the things you like, some of them you maybe don't like, mm. some of them you think, boy, if I was designing me, I would have made myself different. I would have, I would have made myself taller. I would have made myself shorter. I would have made myself skinnier. I would have made myself heavier. I would have, I would have changed my hair color. For some of you women, that's something you do anyway. Uh, no and problem. men do it too. There's, there's men that no have uh, different color of hair underneath the the the, the dye than what the, than what is actually. I have to say, this is all me right here. Uh, but but if we were designing us, if we were creating us, we we maybe would create us or design us differently. Mm -hmm. Maybe you look around the room and you look across the room and you see somebody and you think, boy, I wish I was more like them. The, the amazing thing is they're looking at you thinking the same thing. I wish I was more like them. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that you're, everything about you was designed and, and then God created you according to the pattern, according to the design that he had in his mind. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't you, you weren't just a, it, he didn't just design you and create you and then throw you out there and say, okay, that's, that's, I'm done now. No, he designed you and created you because he has a purpose for you. Yes. And uh, that purpose was, was the reason or the, 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 the idea behind the design. So if you don't like what you are, you, you need to stop and think about that for a minute because if you're telling God I don't like the way I am you're also telling God I, I don't like my purpose yeah. mm -hmm. and and if you do that you're going to be miserable yes. it's when you embrace yourself and embrace what you yeah. are mm -hmm. and you embrace your purpose and your destiny that you're going to find fulfillment in life yes. not what I was planning on speaking about so so, so the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, by the way, you, we, me, I, you are God's chosen people. You were chosen by God. So in a sense, you were chosen twice because you were designed and created by God. And then because of sin, because of corruption in the Garden of Eden, you were in a sense your your perfect nature was stolen, and it was de and and Satan came in and and destroyed God's perfect creation, which was you. Yeah. But then God said, "No, I'm going to choose you a second time, yes. and I am going to make a way so that you can come back to me, and you and I can have that perfect relationship restored." Mm -hmm. And that's what God wants to talk to us today about: is that covenant. It's that second choosing of God choosing you and saying, I still have a purpose for you. Mm -hmm. I still have a design. I have a plan. And I created and designed you in the beginning. And you are the fulfillment of my design and my creation because you have a destiny. Mm -hmm. And so God is saying, I need you to come into covenant with me, yes. into this agreement with me so that you can fulfill your destiny. And by the way, that's the only way mankind will ever find contentment and find fulfillment is by coming into covenant with their creator and discovering and realizing and walking in the perfect design and the perfect thing that you were created to be. That's what Jeremiah was told by God to remind the people of Israel. During this time, the people of Israel were living in rebellion against God. They had been for, for hundreds of years. For hundreds of years, God had been sort of 
contending or in a, in a state of contentious disagreement with his people where God was constantly trying to explain to his people, I want you to live in this perfect state of agreement, this perfect covenant with me. But you need to understand that there's terms for this covenant, this yes. contract. If you sign a contract with somebody, let's say I was going to sell my car to Craig. And so him and I would talk. We would come to an agreement on a price. Then we would, we would either come into a verbal agreement, a verbal contract, or maybe even we might sign a legal document that would spell out the terms of the agreement. I agree to sell my car for such and such a price. You, and, you agree to give me a certain amount of money for my car, we would sign or, or come into at least a verbal contract and both of us, according to the contract, would be responsible for for the terms of the contract. Mm -hmm. Same thing if you, it might be selling a car, might be selling a house, might be uh, some type of work related thing that we enter into a contract with somebody, well then we are accountable or responsible for fulfilling or living according to the terms of the contract. Well, that's the way this covenant was with God. God told Jeremiah, tell my people that I am still interested, I still want them to live in covenant with me, in relationship with me. And he said, these are the terms of the contract. Remind them of the terms because they had quit living according to the terms of the contract. The contract was in the, the simplest form. It was God said, according to the contract, I will take care of you. Mm -hmm. It's a great contract. Mm -hmm. It's a great contract for you to enter into. Mm -hmm. to, tell, to have God say, here's the covenant. I will take care of all of your needs. Everything. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Mm -hmm. God is offering today, again, he's saying, the terms of the contract are this, I will take care of all your needs. That's, the, the, that's, a, that's a big thing. Now that's, simplistically, that's the terms of the covenant. That's God's part. Now we know that God can never violate his word. He can't lie. He can't go back and read negotiate or renege on the terms of the contract. So when God says, this is the covenant, my part is, I will take care of everything you need. Mm -hmm. But he said, there's also your part mm -hmm. of the contract. The contract is between two different people mm -hmm. or two different groups, two different <clears throat> entities. He said, your part of the contract is that you will be my people and you will worship only me. Now, the amazing part of this is in order for God to fulfill his terms of the contract, we have to fulfill our terms of the contract, the covenant. In order for God to keep his covenant with you, you have to keep your part. Because if you don't keep your part, God's not going to be able to take care of you if you're not living in the place that he has set for you to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. Think of it this way. The covenant is a, is, think of it as a bubble. And God says, as long as you stay in this bubble, mm -hmm. nothing can hurt you. Mm -hmm. Nothing can damage you. Now there might be some, there might be some, some uh, pain. There might be uh, things that look like they're hurting you. You might feel pain. There might be some hard things that you have to go through. Not everything is going to be absolutely just peaches and cream in the bubble. But as long as you stay in this bubble, nothing bad can actually happen to you. you the, the part of you that's the most important can never be damaged. That's your soul. As long as you stay in this bubble that I have provided for you, this covenant, you will always be safe. And he's inviting us, he's reminding us today that there's this perfect bubble that he wants us to live in. Mm -hmm. The problem is, if we step out of the bubble, then it, we sort of, 
almost not nullify the contract, but we step out of that protection. Mm -hmm. And when you step out of the bubble, when you step out of the covenant, then you open yourself up yeah. to the attack from the enemy. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the probably oversimplified version of this covenant. But God said, Back in verse 4, the terms I commanded your ancestors when I brought them out of Egypt, out of the iron smelting furnace, I said, obey me and do everything I command you, and you will be my people, and I will be your God. And this is God speaking. Mm -hmm. He says, then I will fulfill the oath I swore to your ancestors to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, the land you possess today. And Jeremiah answered, Amen, Lord. He said, in other words, let it be so. Yes. So God said, according to the covenant, according to what I promised your ancestors way back, thousand, a thousand years ago and beyond, I am going to provide a place for you as mm -hmm. long as you obey me, as long as you stay in the covenant. Yes. Now, in the Old Testament, in the Old Test, in the Old Covenant, the Old Agreement, it was a written down law. That was the law, the Torah, the Ten Commandments that Moses received up on the mountain. Mm -hmm. It was a written down thing. It was a whole list of laws and, and, and things that the, the people of Israel had to do. There were 613 of them that were the laws of the Torah. And it, it covered everything. It covered how they were supposed to treat each other. It's what, it covered their marriage. It covered every part of their culture and society. And it mostly covered how they were to come back into covenant when they broke the covenant. Mm -hmm. It involved animal sacrifices. It involved the shedding of blood. Because in order for the covenant to be sealed, there had to be the shedding of blood. Remember yes. Genesis chapter 3? Mm -hmm. When Adam and Eve sinned yes. and God came to the garden and, they, and, and God said, you broke the perfection that I created mm, yeah. with sin. And in order for that to be restored, there has to be bloodshed. Wow. Mm. And so God killed an animal and made skin so Adam and Eve could be brought back into fellowship with him. Mm. And so the Old Testament covenant involved the shedding of blood. Mm -hmm. When man violated the terms of the covenant, there was actually part of the covenant that enabled God's people to come back into relationship. They had to they had to bring an animal, a sheep, or a couple doves, or a goat. That then the priest would go through this process and there was a certain way that it was to be sacrificed and, it, and the blood was shed and the blood was poured out. And that blood was was important because it reestablished the covenant. It reestablished the relationship. Fast forward into the New Testament. And Jesus came along and he said, I'm here to fulfill that covenant. I'm here to make that covenant complete. Yes. He said, we're going to make a few changes. No longer are you going to need to shed the blood of an animal because I, myself, Jesus, the Son of God, am going to offer myself as yes. the blood sacrifice yes. that will take place once and for all so that people will be able to, to come under the blood of Jesus and be restored into covenant with their God. Right. Mm -hmm. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Mm -hmm. So the blood was important in the establishing of the covenant between God and his people. Yes. In, the old, in the old covenant, there was a list of rules and regulations and laws. And the priests were appointed to help people understand the law, understand the covenant. Mm -hmm. And the people were supposed to live according to the terms of that covenant, those 613 laws and regulations. That was the way it worked. So if you had a question wow. about, about the way you were living, about your behavior, about maybe a relationship or something that you were doing, if you wondered, well, what does God say about this? You would go to the priest and the priest would take the law, the covenant, and he would examine your question in the light of the law and he would say, well, this is what you're supposed to do. 
fast forward into the into the uh, new covenant, the new testament, the new agreement. When Jesus came, he said, "This another change we're going to make is no longer are you going to have to go to the priest to have the law explained to you. Instead, after after my death, after the blood is shed, after I am crucified, I am going to send the Holy Spirit." who will now live inside of you, and he will tell you how to live according to the covenant. Mm -hmm. Now notice, he didn't say, I'm doing away with the covenant. He didn't say, I'm doing away with the law. He said, I'm the fulfillment of it, and the Holy Spirit now lives inside of us. And so instead of you, when you have a, a question about how you're supposed to live, when you have a question, um, Sue, about how you're supposed to treat Cindy, mm -hmm. you don't have to come to me with your question and say, how am I supposed to do this? Because you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He will tell you how you're supposed to treat her. He will tell you whether you're treating her correctly or whether you're treating her wrong. Mm -hmm. He will tell you whether you're violating the covenant. Mm -hmm. It's the same covenant. It's the same agreement that God made with his Israelites that he has now made with us. But now instead of you having to go to a religious figurehead or a religious leader to, to be told how to live, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you who will, who will help you yes. to walk in the terms of the covenant. Yes. If you're struggling with that, you need to get in the Word. Yes. Because the written word will explain the covenant. Mm -hmm. It will explain the relationship with God. That's why the word is so important. Yes. Because it keeps us on track or keeps us informed as to what the covenant mm -hmm. is all about. I want to talk about uh, I'm going to talk I want to talk to you about uh, the three different parts of our covenant with God. And how this works. Uh, this is really basic stuff. I know that this is what God told me to talk about today, so I'm going to talk about it. But I want to talk about the three different, it, it's sort of like the three different parts of our salvation. Because sometimes we get, sometimes people get confused by this. But it's all tied into this covenant. Because our the covenant that God wants to have with us is our salvation. Without the covenant, mm -hmm. there's no salvation. So, the first word I want to talk about is the word justified, justification. Mm -hmm. That's the very first part of our salvation. The second word I'm going to talk about is sanctification. It's also part of our salvation. Mm -hmm. But before we can be sanctified, we have to be justified. Mm -hmm. The third part I want to talk about, I actually don't even have a word for, but it's the, it's the final part of our salvation. It's the final phase of our total salvation. It's when we finally get to heaven and we're totally saved. Mm -hmm. Think about it like this. We start out as a sinner. We were born a sinner. We were born into sin covered with sin, totally separated from God. Not because God wanted to be separated from us, but because sin, God can't be connected to sin. If you yes. try to come into the presence of God in a sinful condition, the sin that is on you would destroy you. It would literally, you would absolutely be annihilated by it. Because the righteousness of God destroys all corruption. And so because of our sin, God had to provide a way that we could become holy again so that we could come into his presence. The way he did that was he sent his son Jesus, who died on the cross, shed his blood, and through the covering of his blood, we could become justified. We could become saved. We could become born again. We no longer have to have sin uh, covering us because we have the opportunity to be justified by Jesus' blood. My dad told me when I was a kid, I'll never forget this, it's always stuck with me. He said the word justified 
if you it, think of it as just as if I've never sinned. Yeah. That's the first part of salvation. This is what happens when you repent of your sin, when you confess to God, God, I'm a sinner. By the way, it doesn't have to be a prayer. It doesn't have to be done in church. I did this when I was 10 years old in my bed upstairs. I told God, God, I, one night I was getting ready, you've heard my testimony, many of you, I was laying down, I was trying to go to sleep, and all of a sudden I realized, if something bad were to happen tonight and I were to die, I would go, I would not be with God. I knew that I was a sinner. I had been told all about it all along as I was a kid, but some, for some reason that night it clicked with me on a very personal level. I need a Savior. Not my dad's Savior, not my mom's Savior, not my brother's Savior. I need my own Savior. Now because I was brought up in the church and I knew who God was and I knew who Jesus was, I knew what I needed. I knew I needed Jesus. It was no big thing for me. It was easy for me that night to tell God and say, God, I need a Savior. I need Jesus. And tonight, I am repenting. I'm admitting that I'm a sinner. And I am asking for forgiveness. I am accepting the blood payment of Jesus. And I am counting on Him for my salvation. That night, I became justified. Mm -hmm. yeah. That night, all of my sin was covered by the blood of Jesus. It was completely done away. It was just as if I'd never sinned. It was just as if I was perfect. I was justified. I became justified that night. That's the very first part of salvation. If, if somebody has not had that experience where they have put their sin under the blood of Jesus, then their salvation can go no farther. Hmm. That's, that's the absolute beginning, and it's the completed deal. Yeah. It's not something that is ongoing. By the way, that night, I did nothing to justify myself. I, I didn't lay on my bed and make all kind of promises to God. God, if, if I, I, I will never sin again. I will never tell another lie. I will never cheat. I will never covet. I will never lust after. I will never... I, I didn't make any of those promises to God. Mm -hmm. I just simply said, God, I need a Savior. Mm -hmm. God said, I'll take it from here. Mm -hmm. He brought me into a perfect state. He brought me into covenant with Him because that was the deal. Mm -hmm. That justification process was absolute, and it was complete, and it was final. Yes. There's no way for me to become unjustified. Mm. Because my sin was covered by the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Same thing, when I got saved, I did not do anything to earn it. On my bed that night, I didn't lay there, and all of a sudden, because of my commitment, and because of my will, and because of my promise to God to never do anything wrong. It wasn't like, well, God said, I'll justify you as long as you don't cheat, as long as you don't steal, as long as you don't murder, as long as you don't commit adultery, as long as you don't covet, as long as you don't lust, as long as you don't... If you, if you don't do any of those things, then, then I'll justify you. you know? God said, you are justified yeah. right now. Yeah. So as far as my eternal salvation was concerned, as far as my home in heaven, that was the night that all got taken care of. Mm -hmm. Same thing's true with you. I don't know exactly what it was, what day it was. I know some of your testimonies. I've heard some of your stories. Some of you, it's all different. But at some point, there was a time in your life when you said, I repent, and God came, Jesus came into your heart, and you became justified. Mm -hmm. But there's another part of our salvation, and it's, and, it, and it's actually part of our salvation. It's the sanctified part. Because after you get justified, and, I, and I, I stress this, it's only after you become justified that you can become sanctified. Mm -hmm. the, the sanctification process starts. 
Now this process is a little different than the justifi justified. The justified part all takes place at one time and it's a completed deal. You can't add to it, you can't subtract away from it. The sanctification process is, is the, it's sort of like the cleaning up part. Yeah. Think, of the, think of the word sanctified, think of it as, as the root word sanitized. Mm. It's the cleaning part. It's the part of that God now puts you through this process to clean you up. Mm -hmm. It's the part that he gets rid of the stuff mm -hmm. that is damaging to you. Yes. Now understand something. The covenant was God's idea. It wasn't ours. Much as we'd like to take credit for it, it was God's idea in the beginning. And the reason it was God's idea was based on God's love. Mm. Because he loved us, he said, I do not want my people to go in through all through eternity separated from me. So I'm going to introduce, I'm going to have a way that I can enter into this covenant with them. So the first part of it, I'm going to justify them. I'm going to wipe out their sin. Mm. I'm going to wipe out their guilt so that we can spend eternity together. Mm. But then he, real, then he said, after they're justified, after that part is taken care of, I am going to have a process to eliminate all the things they do to themselves that are hurtful to themselves. Mm -hmm. Because when you sin, when you, when you disobey God, you cause damage to yourself. Now it's true, you might also cause damage to people around you. Mm -hmm. But the person that is the most damaged by your sin, by your uh, disobedience, is you. Mm -hmm. No matter how much damage you do to somebody else, you're doing more damage to yourself. And God said, I wanna, I'm going to have a process that I can eliminate or I can take mm -hmm. away or help these people clean themselves up so that they won't damage themselves. This has nothing to do with your justification. I keep saying that because there's a lot of, there's a lot of religious uh, teaching that has confused these two things. Mm -hmm. They think in order for somebody to be justified, in order for somebody to become pure, they first have to go through the sanctification process. Mm -hmm. And so they try to, they're, so they're trying to clean people up and saying, "I'm telling Amy, well, before you can be justified, you have to, you have to give up this bad habit, or you have to, you have to quit uh, kicking Scott at night when you're sleeping, or you have to, you have to, you have to clean everything up. And, and if you can become good enough, if we can become sanctified enough, then we can, then you can start to think about." being justified. Mm -hmm. No, it's you're justified first. Yeah, yes. The sanctification process can't even start right. until you become justified. It's basic, but you wouldn't believe how much problem is being mm -hmm. caused in people's lives mm -hmm. because the religious people yeah. have got this backwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're trying to sanctify people mm -hmm. under the guise and under the under the the, uh, the idea that in order to be justified, you have to be sanctified first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't. Mm -hmm. That night on my bed, I didn't clean myself up a bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was justified. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. night yeah. was also the night that the sanctification process started in me. Mm -hmm. yeah. I regret to tell you that here we are 54 years later and the process is still going on. I am still under the sanctification process. Now I'm looking around the room and I think it's still going on in all of you also. Because I don't see a single person in this room that is completely without fault. I am going to say it again. I'm not talking about your eternal soul. That 
is secure. Right. That was justified. Yes. But the sanctified part, yeah. I don't know, Liz. We're still <laughs> in the process. <laughs> yeah, there's still some things that God is dealing with, but He's doing it. He's yes. cleaning you. Yeah, he's he's, cleaning. he's making you yeah. better. I'm going to show you a little yeah. illustration here in a minute yes. that might help you with this. But I, it's these two words that I'm mainly interested in. Is you understanding us? We we need to. We absolutely need to understand about being fully justified. Yes. Mm -hmm. I can't stress enough how important it is to know that that took place fully. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. one of the mistakes people make is yeah. they don't realize how fully they have been redeemed. Mm -hmm. We absolutely need to learn to walk in full redemption. Yes. We don't need for the process to be fuller. It's complete. Yeah. But we need to learn to walk in what has happened. So it's those two words, the justification and the sanctification. It's part of your salvation. So when I talk about eternal salvation, I'm talking about being justified. Mm -hmm. But then the Apostle Paul also said in the scripture, he said... I am working out my salvation with fear and trembling. He was talking there about the sanctified part. Right. Because he was the Apostle Paul, the writer of most of the New Testament, was like us. He was saying, I'm not fully cleaned up yet. He said, I'm still working some things out. Right. I'm still coming, I'm still, I'm still working this out. God is still cleaning me up. By the way, I'll, I'll say this, it's God that does both parts. Yes. This will be a relief to some of you because some of you think you need to clean everybody else up. No. <laughs> That's not our job. My job is not to clean you up. That's right. In fact, my job isn't even really to clean myself up. My job is to simply come into agreement with the cleaning part that God is doing. Yes. God, God's doing the sanctifying. He's cleaning me up. All I need to do is sort of stay on the table. Think about going in for an operation, mm -hmm. and I have something that needs done to me physically. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be the guy that's taken out my appendix. Mm -hmm. I, that, that's, the, there's going to be a doctor there that does that. My job is to put myself on the table mm -hmm. so that the doctor can do what he needs to do. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the way the sanctifying part works. Mm -hmm. I need to let God do the cleaning. The same God that justified me is also sanctifying me. Mm -hmm. My part is to allow that process right. to take place, mm -hmm. to allow him to continue to take the things away from me or to put the things in me that need to be there. Right. Mm -hmm. The third part of our salvation, and I don't have a word for it exactly, but it's the eternal part. It's the part when we finally get to heaven mm -hmm. and the salvation experience is completed at that point. At that point, we will no longer need, need to be sanctified because we will be 100% perfect. By the way, this cannot take place while we're living in these bodies. No. Because our bodies are corrupt. So the final phase is when we get to heaven and we're with Jesus and now we're no longer living in this mortal body but we are now 100% free and 100% pure and we can live in 100% covenant with our God. Mm -hmm. yes. <clears throat> so. I missed that third thing that you said. I don't have a word for it. It's when we get to heaven. <laughs> well, that didn't That's it. Glorify. Glorify. The glorification. Mm -hmm. The glorify. Yeah. The glorify. You Thank you. I knew there was a word. So this, the first part yeah. is justification, yeah. the second part is sanctification, yeah. the cleaning part, and the third part is glorified, glorification. Yeah. Yeah. When we're totally glorified, we're, we're, that's, that's the final phase of our salvation. It yes. takes place when we are finally yes. in heaven with Amen. Jesus. Boy, I can't wait for that day. Yeah. Yeah. Because the... Between you and me, sometimes the sanctification process is a little bit hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or a lot hard. Yeah. So, 
I have here two eggs. Two eggs. <laughs> what, you see these two eggs? Can you tell a difference? There's something very different about these two eggs. One's hard boiled. One's hard boiled and one's not. Can you tell which one's which? No. Just by looking? No. You can't tell. Are we going to play eight roulette? We don't have to because there is a simple, there's a few simple ways you can tell the difference between a hard boiled egg and a soft boiled egg. Yep. It's not a hard thing to do. Break them. Yeah, that's one way. <laughs> you, if, I, if I bang it on the table, it, it'll, it'll show us. But here's what I want to show you. Just like, just like these two eggs, this is the way we started our life. We came out with like this egg. The justification process is the hard boiling part. This morning, Cindy and I hard boiled one of these eggs. Now, they're inherently different. By the way, that hard boiling part can never be undone. That justification part can never be undone. If this is, the, I think this is the hard boiled egg. Spin it. Spin it and it'll tell you. That's it. So this is the hard boiled egg. This egg is still in its natural state. You can't tell the difference. But they, they act differently. Right. If I tried to spin this one, it won't spin. Right. But the difference is all on the inside. Mm -hmm. Same thing happened when you got justified. The morning I woke up after I was justified, mm -hmm. nobody could tell. Mm -hmm. Unless I said something. Mm -hmm. right. If I told my parents, if I told my brothers and sisters, I said, hey, I got saved last night. Because they knew what that meant, they would have rejoiced, they would have celebrated, but they wouldn't have been able to see any difference. Right. Same thing's true with you. The day you got saved, nothing happened on the outside. You didn't all of a sudden become better looking. You didn't all of a sudden get a glow about you. You didn't all of a sudden get taller. Did you? No. <laughs> you didn't all of a sudden lose weight. Some of you maybe had some habits you didn't like. Some of you still smoked cigarettes. Some of you still drank alcohol. Some of you still were abusive to your spouse. Some of you were still mean. Some of you still told lies. Some of you still cheated. Because all of that justification process was like this egg. It all took place inside. Yeah. So you can't always tell the difference between people that are saved and people that aren't. That's right. Now the world would like to tell you that, that's, that it doesn't work that way, but it does work that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't look around the room and say which of you is saved and which of you aren't. Right. Most of you, I've heard your testimony and I, I believe what you tell me, but you could be lying to me. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm actually an easy guy to fool. I tend to believe what people tell me. Yeah. So I don't have any way of knowing whether you're actually justified or not. Yeah. But you know. Yeah. I'm the only guy in the room that actually knows whether I'm safe. Yeah. Sure. Because that part of the process is purely unseen. That's mm -hmm. with these two eggs. Mm -hmm. So one of them, one of these eggs is saved and the other one's not. But once you're saved, once you're justified, now the Holy Spirit can begin the sanctification process. Mm. Now this is interesting. I'm going to spin it again to make sure we got the right one. Because this this egg, I'm going to I'm going to peel this egg and eat it in a second here. But I'm not going to eat this egg with the shell on. It will not be good. Mm -hmm. It's not really edible this way. That's the way when you started your journey in the covenant yeah. and you became justified, God said, yeah, you're justified, but now I need to put you through the sanctification process so that you can fulfill your destiny, so that you can become what you were designed and what you were created for. This egg has a purpose. 
this particular egg, the purpose of this egg is so that it can be eaten by me. <laughs> but it can't be eaten by me the way it is. Mm -hmm. I need to sanctify it. Mm -hmm. I need to clean it up. So you know what I do? I start the sanctification process, and unfortunately, the sanctification process is like this for a lot because the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bang this egg on something solid. Oh. <laughs> it's going to cause pain to the egg. <laughs> Same way that God taps you a couple times mm -hmm. and he breaks yeah. that hard shell oh. that you had around you wow. in your natural state. Yeah. What would happen... What would happen if I would try to start the sanctification process with this egg? Make a mess. It'll make a mess. Yeah. That's why there's so much mess in the church today. Yeah. Because we're trying to sanctify people that haven't been justified. Yeah. With the idea, some uh, perverted way, that if we can do the sanctification process, that we can turn them into this. Mm. The unconverted, unjustified people need a hard shell around them. Yes. It's the thing that keeps them together. Yeah. It's the thing that's literally keeping them alive. Yeah. Without that hard shell, they would be a mess. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to demonstrate that because I love my wife and I'm not going to make a mess all over her carpet. But you know, we all know what would happen if I were to bang this egg mm -hmm. on the table. Yes. And if I were to start the sanctification process that God puts us through because little by little, he begins to peel off this hard shell that we used to have around us mm -hmm. when we were unsaved. Before we were justified. Mm -hmm. And so first he bangs us against something hard. He cracks that shell that you no longer need. Because once you're justified, you are different on the inside. Wow. Amen. Just like this yep. egg is different than that egg. Yes. And so God begins to peel off the parts that we no longer need, but also make us unappetizing to Him. Yes. Yes. Now, if you'll notice, as I peel off the shell, the part that God no longer needs, He peels it off little by little, just like I'm doing with the egg. First, it's a bad habit. Then it's a disobedience. Then it's then it's uh, the way we treat people, mm -hmm. and and it's the way we used to think. It's the yeah. way we used to behave. Yeah. He's completely mm -hmm. taking off that shell mm -hmm. that that used to be our protection. Mm -hmm. That used to be what we needed to keep us safe. Mm -hmm. He's peeling it off. And it takes a while. He's very meticulous because just like me, God doesn't want to get shells in his teeth. I actually was sitting with a, with a bunch of guys. This was years ago when we were young and dumb. And uh, we were sitting there and there was some eggs sitting on the table. I don't remember what the deal was, how it happened, but we dared a kid to eat a soft boiled egg. The shell and everything. Oh. And the, the kid that was even younger and dumber than me said, I'll do it. <laughs> and I watched this guy eat a soft boiled egg. He took an egg like this, stuck it in his mouth and chewed it up. Oh. It was gross. Mm -hmm. It was like, he was like gagging on it and there was shell stuck in his teeth and it, yeah. was, it was nasty. Now, look at Once the sanctification process Look at, you can see a difference. Big difference. Yes, yeah. It's a huge difference. It's noticeably different. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's two different things. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the same thing that's going to happen with you. As the sanctification process takes place, you're going to become 
different than the world. Unfortunately, there's a lot of Christians that get saved, they get justified, but that's all the farther they want to go because they don't want to stand out. They don't want to be different. This is the way the whole world looks. It's useless for what we're talking about today. I'm not eating this thing. So God says, first, I'm going to justify you. Then I'm going to sanctify you. And then once he gets all the little pieces off and gets us all cleaned up, Put a little salt and vinegar on. <laughs> glorification. This is the glorification. Yeah. Wow. Oh. <laughs> okay. Where's the egg? It's in me. It's in me. I'm the master. I'm the master. I'm the one that turned this into what I just showed you. I'm God in this illustration. It was God that boiled the egg. I did it this morning. I had some assistance from my lovely wife who told me how to do it to make sure it got done right. <laughs> There's actually several different ways to boil an egg. <laughs> we we wanted it to be right, so. But I'm the one that boiled the egg. I'm the one that sanctified or justified. Mm -hmm. I'm the one. I'm the master. I'm the one that peeled the egg. The master peeled the egg. The master puts us through the sanctification process. Mm -hmm. Now, the final step, the glorification part, is when we finally are totally glorified. We are not going to recognize ourselves anymore mm -hmm. because ourselves will be completely obliterated mm -hmm. by the glorification process. Once we get consumed by the master, the egg is still in existence. The egg is still there. You know where it is? Mm -hmm. Right now, as we speak, that egg is becoming part of me. Mm, wow. Think about this. Mm -hmm. The egg, the nutrients, the, the vitamins, the good stuff that was part of that egg, mm -hmm. even as we speak, they're now being digested. They're in my stomach and they're being turned into a form that the egg is now beginning to form new cells. The egg is wow. becoming the master. Mm -hmm. The same thing is this what this covenant is all about. Mm -hmm. It's about you coming into relationship with God and Him saying your sin is no longer an issue mm -hmm. because I have provided a way and I have cleaned it up. All you need to do is accept what I did. Mm -hmm. So your sin is no longer an issue. But you still have some things that I'm going to clean up once we've taken care of that. And so the sanctification process that we're all engaged in right now is taking place. And God is literally peeling off the parts of us that make us undesirable for Him. And He is cleaning us up. He is making us usable. He is making us sanctified, cleaned up. And the final phase is when we are totally consumed by Him mm -hmm. and we lose all sense of ourselves, yes. all sense of our identity, and we go through that glorified process mm -hmm. and now we can become part of God. Yes. We can become part of the kingdom mm -hmm. because that's the purpose of this covenant. God saw man. God created man perfect. There was no need for a covenant. We were created as part of Him, as part of His kingdom, as, as perfection. Sin came into the problem because all kinds of mess. And so God said, I'm going to restore man. I'm going to offer covenant. I'm going to offer relationship. Yes. The, the, the relationship starts 
with a, 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 a hot boiling process where we have to go through the furnace where he can change us on the inside. He can remove all of the sin. He can cover it over. He can turn us literally inside out where we become different inside. Mm -hmm. And then he puts us, then we go through the sanctified, the sanctification process where he gets rid of all of the stuff and cleans all of the things that are damaging to our our destiny and our purpose. There was nothing about peeling the egg that made the egg hard boiled. It's the same way is true. You cannot sanctify yourself enough to become justified. All you will do is create a mess when we try to do that. But once that sanctification takes place, hallelujah, I will be consumed by God. My body, my identity will completely disappear and I will become the thing that I was created to be in the beginning, mm -hmm. which is part of God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. yes. You will never eat a hard-boiled egg again without thinking about mm -hmm. this. Right. Every time you eat a hard-boiled egg, you will think about being justified mm -hmm. and then sanctified and then being consumed by God. Yes. Father God, thank you 